and good morning if you're in London, good evening if you're in um, Sydney, which is where Louisa is, um, and good uh, good morning wherever you are in the world, or good or hello. Perhaps we should just say hello. And yeah. um, my name is Kim Nash, and I'm head of publicity over here at Booker Chore. Welcome to this Facebook Live today with the fabulous La Larkin, who does have a real name as well, which is Louisa. Louisa, thank you so much for joining me. Oh no, it's been, I've been looking forward to this. It's so exciting. It's a chance to chat to you um from all the way over in australia and you all the way over in england so it's it's great absolutely so louise is coming to us tonight from sydney australia um i'm in staffordshire in the uk um if you are joining us today please do um say hi in the comments um it would be lovely to see you let us know that you're here if you have any questions for louisa pop them in the comments and i'll try and get through as many questions as possible and um, because we're quite um transatlantic is that the word um if you would like to tell us where you're coming from that would be really cool as well yeah. so that we know where in the world you're coming from which would be awesome um and we're going to be talking today particularly about your latest book widow's island um which is incredible <laughs> a fantastic fantastic read um so perhaps we should start off louisa can i ask you a little bit about your journey to publication and how you've kind of ended up with book Jewelry, really Okay, um, well, um, oh, Jones Publications. So, oh, well, it actually all started um, a while back when um, I had a book published um, in Australia and then I was invited over to Crime Fest in Bristol to do, um, to be on a panel. And that was amazing. I was, I was very excited about that. And um, so I was on the panel and the, the lovely author who was chairing the panel called Emlyn Reese, who is um, a fantastic author, um, asked me if I had representation in the UK and I said, no, I didn't. And he introduced me to um, an agent called Phil Patterson, who is now my, has been ever since my agent. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, of course he, um, then went and um, started pitching my books and things like that. So it was fantastic. How I came to Bookature, well, again, that was Phil. Um, he was very excited by what Bookature is, was, is doing. Um, and um, I uh, got a chance to talk remotely, obviously online, to Helen. Um, just to share. Helen. To Helen's just Helen there. Oh, hello, Helen. Hi. Hello. Um, and um, I just knew I would be in the best hands and I, I loved her immediately. Um, I loved her approach to everything and I loved her most of all because she's got a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm biased in everything and everything is dog-tastic, but yes, everything is dog-tastic. Um, so, no, in all seriousness, um, it was just a joy um to meet Helen and after that I kept saying to Phil my agent please let her say yes please let her say yes and she did say yes and here we are today with Widow's Island. Brilliant um so Widow's Island came out recently do you want to tell us a little bit about that book and where the inspiration came for it? Wow okay so uh Widow's Island is a crime thriller it's about an ordinary woman who's actually a very shy woman um, who's just lost her husband. He's a war hero um, in America. Um, and um, so she's grieving. Um, she doesn't know what to do. Um, she also has a secret and that secret haunts her. And she decides to move pretty much across the whole of America to a remote island in Washington state with her teenage daughter, Amy. And they move to this island and they try and start a new life but it all goes slowly and horribly wrong. They're set upon by internet trolls um, who uh, incite a lot of anger against Stephanie, who is the central character and the daughter, Amy. And it moves into physical threats and um, a uh, friend, a very close to her is murdered. Um, so the, the sort of the threats become real physical threats. And the story is about a woman who um, must find a courage that she never knew she had to save her daughter's life and to 
hold on to everything that she loves in the world. Um, the inspiration for this um, actually came back in 2016, quite a long time ago now, um, end of 2016, because we're all on social media these days and, you know, um, you, you occasionally have a look at what's trending. And I was looked at, looked at something and did a double take and it was December 2016. I did this double take and I thought, no, 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 no. That can't be trending. That's not right. And I went in and had a look at some of the posts and I was horrified. And it was a hashtag. It was a really horrible hashtag. So I'm just warning people now that it was a really horrible hashtag. And that hashtag was beating women is happiness. And it was a real hashtag and it was trending. And I looked at that and I thought, I cannot believe that that is, you know, going on Twitter and what is behind that? And what are these trolls that are doing these, saying these awful things about women? And it, that was kind of the beginning of the story. Wow, incredible. Um, I'm just gonna see who we've got with us. There's lots of people here. Some are, some are a bit shy and not talking to us, but there's some people that are not shy. One well, of which shy is Noel people. Holt. Don't be shy. <laughs> Ask a question be shy say hello. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, lovely Noelle is here, who's in the UK. And Noelle says, I first came across you as a blogger when I won a competition for Devoured. And now I work with you, which is so amazing. <laughs> um, we also have Nikki Sutter. Hi, Nikki. Um, Helen is obviously here. Selena Power is here, all the way from Brisbane. Um, Edwina Brown is here from Yapton in West Sussex in the UK. Hello, Edwina. Um, David Gaylor says, hi, Louisa, good luck with your launch. Um, lovely Helen Pfeiffer has popped in to say hello. And Ali Mercer um, is also saying hello from Oxfordshire. Oh, and Anne Crooks just snuck in there before I was about to ask you another question. So Hello, um, Anne. <laughs> oh, Liam. Um, hey, Liam. Liam, Liam Savile. Um, so, um, so how do you go about doing the research for your books, Louisa? Because obviously, you know, there's going to be a lot of research into um you know crime the book set in seattle isn't it yeah well it's 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 actually based on a real island um so off seattle there are quite a number of islands and the only way on and off some of them actually have bridges but there are quite a number that the only way on and off is a ferry um and if you get rough seas like storms as you do they are completely cut off um so the research well these days, of course, research, we can't really go anywhere. We're all kind of um, unable to shift around between countries. Um, but luckily, the, um, because the idea, the germ of this story came about while I was writing another book um, uh, because of that hashtag, and I started thinking about um, what kind of personality what kind of person would actually write a, a dreadful hashtag like this what kind of group of people would attack a woman on that basis um and i started looking into also whether there was any kind of link between um uh so cyber trolls the really hardcore ones because there are whole levels of cyber trolls from you know, your your internet mum who uh, particularly hates another mum and just starts spreading nasty rumours about them right the way through to the dedicated night after night trying to find vulnerable people online and they don't even know them and they go and attack them and they want them to be miserable and hurt themselves and blah, blah, blah. And I, I was thinking, would there be any kind of link between um, someone who did that um would they ever come out from behind their computer because there's always the assumption that internet trolls are basically they always do it from the safety of behind a screen it's always anonymous so they're you know some people would say well that's a cowardly way of doing it but they, they don't come out um and then i read this article about um, a japanese professor who was um attacked by a particular internet troll who turned out to be his student and the student one day um, was uh, basically lost it and stabbed the professor to death. So he actually did come out from behind the computer and he committed murder. 
And I wanted to understand more about that. And I, and I realized that if I was going to write a story that is linked to serial killers, I needed to really talk to experts. And um, one of the people that facilitated my ability to talk to experts on this is actually here tonight. And his name is David. Um, and he's a retired detective chief superintendent. And I rely on him for all things policing. <laughs> and he's absolutely amazing. He's also one of my first readers. So is his lovely wife, Lynn, who may be here as well. I'm not sure. Um, and he's been just the loveliest person helping me. And it was big through David that. Uh, so one day I, I, I emailed David and I said, David, you don't by any chance know anybody in the FBI, do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, you might as well ask, what have you got to lose? Um, you know, and I had heard a lot of rumours from other crime fiction authors about how very difficult it is, um, particularly American authors had difficulties to, you know, uh, get any kind of contact with the FBI. They used to be very happy to talk to script writers and authors, but then they got a bit of a bashing in fiction. People misrepresented them. They made out they were very bad people and they got a bit fed up with it. And so they stopped. They said, no, we're not going to do this anymore, um, except for authors we already knew. And so anyway, to cut a very long story short, David wove some magic um, and managed to pave the way for me to start communicating with a special agent in the FBI um, in Seattle. And um, I was in America shortly after that at Thriller Fest, which is the big Thriller Festival in New York. And I flew all the way to Seattle to meet this woman, um, um, this fantastic woman um, in um, Seattle. And we arranged to have a coffee. And um, this will probably amuse you because I remember thinking, I don't know anything about her. I don't know what she looks like. Um, clearly, obviously, if you're in the FBI, you're not on social media for safety reasons and various things like that. So I emailed her and said, you know, I don't know what you look like. Can you describe yourself so that when I'm sitting in this cafe, I know you're walk, you know, who you are? And she emailed back and went, don't worry, I know what you look like. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, she's checked me out. And I'm thinking, of course yes. she's checked you out. Yes. You know, everything about you. I'm, in fact, I'm just thinking, how many parking tickets have I had? And how many, how many bad things have I done in my life? And, you know, is she going <laughs> to meet you with me? Um, fortunately, I, oh, well, I hope I haven't done too many things that are too bad. And um, so... You know, she did agree to meet with, meet with me. One of the things, Kim, I remember distinctly, and this was what was so unexpected, I had dressed deliberately in a suit. I was very, you know, smart. Um, uh, we had pre-agreed all the questions. Um, I saw her walking down the road towards me. I knew, I knew instantly the way she was walking and looking straight at me that it was her. And I should put my hand out you know, to say, you know, I'm Louisa and, you know, lovely to meet you. And what I didn't expect, she hugged me. Okay. She took me in her arms and gave me a big hug and said, thank you for coming to see me all the way from Australia. Um, and I was, I, I was actually completely <laughs> taken aback because that's the last thing I expected. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, uh, the other odd thing about this is that as she was hugging me, which was really nice and very friendly, all I could feel was her gun in my ribcage, <laughs> which was, <laughs> under, you know, the way they, they wear the holsters under the arm. I was like thinking, oh, she's real. She's actually wearing a gun. <laughs> and it was, it was just a big freak out for me. Anyway, I'll, st I'll stop. That's my answer to the question. <laughs> Oh, no, that's a fascinating story. It, um, it really, really is. Um, right, let's see who else we have had join us because we have some people that I'm sure you will know. Um, we have, I think, I'm, I'm going to say my awful Spanish accent, Jose from Granada. Granada oh, in Spain. fantastic. We have Natalie Livings all the way from Melbourne who took a crime and thriller writing course with you. Yes, hello, Natalie. Thanks for joining oh, me. It's yeah. lovely to see you. Well, I can't really see you, but, you know. I will talk about your um, writing courses as well in a second. We have Mordreth has also here, 
Carmel shoot all the way from um oh she says she's from Sisters in Crime. Oh yes, oh, hello Sisters in Crime, in Crime Australia. They are wonderful, wonderful support for female crime fiction authors in Australia. Brilliant. Um Corinne Smith is here from Tasmania. Oh hello. So definitely got people coming in here. Um, we have Whitney Fitzsimmons from Seattle, would you believe? Oh, hello Whitney. Hey. Um, we have <laughs> Lindy Cameron and Paula Duggan. And Lindy is also from Sisters in Crime as well. So um, hello, Lindy. Um, so Selena Power said, You have made the island in the story so very creepy and it, sh it sent shivers down my spine. What made you decide to set Widow's Island actually on an island? Oh, um, well, that's a great question because I have always wanted to set a crime thriller on an island um and i think a lot of us know a lot of very beautiful islands and the whole idea of the perfect holiday is to go to this lovely island and escape everything and it's all peaceful you're back to nature it's beautiful you've got lovely you know beach and all that sort of thing but Islands can also have their downside. And what I really like the idea of is um, that if, as I mentioned, if there's a storm and say the only access on and off the island is through um, the, the small ferries that chug backwards and forwards between Seattle and this particular island, which is based on a real island, um, and you can't get off. That also means that help can't get on. And it also means that if you could be actually trapped with a killer on that island, and all these scenarios were going through my head, what I really like about islands is that you isolate a central character that's already under pressure. Because, you know, in, in my mind, you know, crime thriller is all about, you know, mounting the pressure on the central character, you know, um, um, you know complication after complication. And, um, the real stress is that you know if they're on this island and no help can come to them what are they going to do are they going to rise to the occasion are they is she going to be able to save her daughter um and i really love the idea that the cavalry can't come charging in so yeah. I, I love the island because they, they're also like they can be very dark and spooky particularly this one has got a lot of forest on it um you know big pine tree forests which are very gorgeous to wander through during the day, but at night they can be um, incredibly dark, incredibly dark, because an island also, you know, um, there's not a lot of lighting. The lighting is only on the coastal part of it. Yeah, so um, great question. Oh, and Whitney is asking if you can tell us which island your book is based on. <laughs> okay, well, it's okay, because I do say in the book, but I say very clearly that, um, I loved being on Vashon Island, which is where I've spent many a lovely summer. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but I've actually changed the name of it to Whisper Island in the book um, because, you know, some pretty scary things happen in the story and I didn't want local people to get really upset with me. So, uh, yes, Whitney, it is Vashon Island. Ooh. And the people from Station 19 in Grey's Anatomy won't be going to, you know, to help you out, will they? Because that's all <laughs> I'm going to Seattle. <laughs> that's, that's my knowledge of Seattle is everything yeah, I've ever getting. Yeah, that's great. No, I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> you'd, be okay. you'd be okay if something happened to you because those people could look after you, so that's really cool. Yeah, that's true. Fantastic. Um, Nick Young says, I received my copy this morning and I'm delighted. Nick is asking about your meetings with the FBI agent, which we've already talked about, but was there anything else that kind of stood out from that meeting um, in your mind that, or what, you know, was she, was she forthcoming with information? Yeah, so um, I had to pre-agree everything. Um, it had to go through various people to vet it, to make sure that I wasn't asking anything they didn't want me to ask. Also, um, she came with someone else and they recorded it. And so uh, there were a couple of questions that they, uh, this other person stepped in and said, uh, no, she can't answer that. 
um, and I can completely understand they were for security reasons. She was amazing. Um, the bit about it all, of course, uh, we talked about, you know, serial killers um, because unfortunately for Seattle, it is rather well known um, for having um, some of the worst serial killers living there, really like the Green River Killer and various others, dreadful. Um, she was very um she was very helpful on stuff like that she was very helpful on my query which was about you know um the personality traits of a serial killer and the personality traits of a cyber troll and whether or not there are any similarities and this leads to something that is mentioned actually in the book because there is an fbi special agent character and he plays a secondary role because stephanie miller the mother is the central character. She is the hero of the book. But TJ Sampson is the special agent, is also very important. And what he talks about in the book is the dark tetrad, um, or tetrad, I suppose, depending on how you say it. Um, and that's um, the dark tetrad is psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and sadism. It used to be the first three, and then more recently they've added sadism, and they are the character traits of a serial killer. Um, and it, that's recognized through research. But more recently, they're saying those traits are being seen in the hardcore cyber trolls. And this, this dark tetrad is behind the kind of, well, it is definitely behind the, the creation of the serial killer character that I've created for Widow's Island. So she was very helpful with that. But the thing that I found most, oh, interesting from a female's point of view was how you do a job like hers where you see the worst of humanity um and you have your mum and you have kids and you know you have you have friends and a life and the impact that must have you know how you can still be normal i suppose and live a normal life and she was talking about um she actually made a joke uh, which i thought was very pertinent and it's something i'll probably use in a future book but um when she was younger and she joined the fbi out of quantico um you know she she said it was actually very she was single it was very difficult to meet any men unless they were in the fbi because you know what guy <laughs> She said, what guy wants to go out with a woman who's in the FBI? It's like, I'll tell you now, they do not want that. <laughs> they do not. Half of them are scared, witless, that, you know, you're going to arrest them. And then the other half are kind of a bit intimidated, maybe. Um, but she said it was really, really difficult for me to finally meet the right man and fall in love because it became quite a barrier. And I, I kind of understand that. That might be difficult. Mm -hmm. The personal yeah. stuff that she talked about, I found she, she was re remarkably open about stuff like that. But the one thing she made me absolutely promise was that I would never, of course, mention her name. But she could be watching right now. She could, she probably is. <laughs> <laughs> checking out that I'm doing the right thing. Well, I've, I've worked it out because I'm a very good detective. Also, that's her undercover name. <laughs> yeah, it could be Whitney. Oh. Absolutely. Um, so this is book one in the series. Can you tell us a little bit about book two? Well, now that's a good question, Kim. I'm not sure if it's book two in a series. There is um, a similar, there is a character that continues in book two. I'm not sure if Helen would see it as a series. I'm not sure, but it's definitely still set in Washington State. Um, at the moment, it's, you know, called Eagle Falls, but, you know, who knows, that might change. It's coming out in October. Um, and this one is about um, a lonely young woman um, who is ostracised from her small country hometown. The reason why she's ostracised um, uh, is not something I'm going to sort of give away right now, um, but it's actually a pretty awful reason why she's ostracised from this town. The big thing is that she is the only witness to a murder um, uh, that is made to look like um, a kind of home fire, which is a tragic accident. So a family dies in it, but she has seen that it was deliberately lit. The problem is 
that the, that nobody believes her. And she goes from being um, a witness to what is a murder to the suspect um, and the killer, the serial killer behind these um, arson attacks is determined to make it look as if she is doing it. Ooh, so that sounds another fantastic book. Can't wait to read it. Um, <laughs> the, one thing that, the one thing that fascinates me, Louisa, is you're from the UK originally. You live in Australia, in Sydney. Why did you set your book in Seattle? <laughs> you know, that it can get very confusing. Can I just be honest and say it can get... Yeah. Um, so I have... I love setting books in different places. Um, I've set books in Antarctica. I've set books in Australia. I've set books in New York. Um, you know, uh, I've set books in London. The Olivia Wolfe books were, uh, she, she's a Londoner. Um, the, the, it just, I don't know, it was just, it seemed right. I don't know, I think it was because Seattle is so well known for serial killers. And I just thought, you know, it, I, I loved all the beautiful mountains and the forests, the water, um, which is called Puget or Puget Sound. Sorry, I must say it right. Um, um, and I just thought, you know, uh, this will be a great place to create um, a number of books. And so I was just drawn to the location. I'm often drawn to a location um, for a particular story. Um, it is interesting, though, when it gets down to the fine tuning of the copy and the, the exact words and grammar and slang that you're using, because I'm already second guessing myself to a certain extent because you know, I was educated in England. I've lived in Australia 20 years. I came here as a backpacker. Um, and now I'm creating a book in which every character is, bar one, I think, is American and come from different parts of America where they have different slang words and different um, ways of, of constructing sentences. Um, and with Widow's Island, um, I, I have to say that it, it initially was like quite. Um, confronting to try and as I was writing going no 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 it's not a pram it's a stroller and no 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 it's not um you know a front deck it's a porch and no 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 it's not a par uh, car park it's a parking lot but 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 Helen came to my rescue and she said don't worry I've got a fantastic American copy editor who mm. will help you and Americanize everything and I'm going um because it's yeah, you're right. It's um, it's way harder than I thought it was going to be. Actually, I love it, and I find it really interesting. But I, I sort of find I'm thinking almost in different, um, I suppose, dialects in many ways. And have you set any books in Australia? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You have done Australian. The first books. two had um, first two I ever wrote um, had um, Australian central characters. Yeah. Cool. Um, now somebody, I you know, might well be going and having another one, you know. <laughs> um, somebody had mentioned earlier on that they've been along to one of your um, teaching classes. Tell us, oh, yeah. tell us a little bit about because um, you you do that as well, don't you? Yes, um, I love teaching. I love te well. I teach creative writing. I've got a degree in literature from the University of London, um, and as you can tell from that, I love literature, books of all kinds. Um, uh, but I remember that when I was, um, I started writing and I had a full-time job, um, there were really very few courses that I could do in Australia on thriller writing, um, or they just didn't work with the timing of me having a full-time job. And now all these years later, well, it's not that long, um, but these years later, I want to be able to help um, and encourage authors um, to write crime fiction particularly, but to do creative writing generally. And what was really lovely during lockdown, during the world's COVID pandemic, um, I shifted from face-to-face -face teaching of creative writing to uh, using, you know, obviously online technology, um, using Zoom mainly. And um, it was a joy. It was actually a joy. And um, a lot more people were enrolling to do creative writing courses. And I think what it was is 
A lot of people were stuck at home. They wanted to try something new. They were also feeling starved in a way of, uh, you know, ways of expressing themselves. And it was it was really interesting that um, I was end up doing a lot more classes um, during COVID lockdown. And, and it was great for me because I was talking to people who were so passionate about their writing. Um, and for me, in many ways, it also helps alleviate because we all got a bit lonely, you know, we all did. It was very difficult. Um, but to actually have that interaction and Zoom isn't perfect, you know, um, but, you know, being able to meet people like Whitney, for instance, um, you know, um, and and be able to share a passion. Mm, absolutely it's one of the reasons why we started doing all these facebook lives that we're doing and i think you know loads yeah. of publishers are doing it and whilst it's you know it's upsetting for a lot of authors that they can't go into bookshops and do talks in bookshops you can actually you know a lot more people can have access to authors because like today we've got so many people from around the world yes. joining in that, you know they wouldn't be able to do that normally it would just be the people that could kind of get to your local bookshop probably so um, you know, I think it's been a wonderful thing, really. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, it's definitely um, sort of enabled people from all over the world to start connecting with each other um, more readily. Um, I totally agree. I mean, obviously, there's been downsides on people's mental health and, and obviously physical health as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely been a joy. And um, to do something like this, you know, we've got people from you know america and spain and australia and england and uh various places and isn't that fantastic i think really that's really cool. i love it no it really is and whitney's just said your crime writing class was excellent oh thank you um, um <laughs> <Melanie we'll tell laughs> <you> later <laughs> <laughs> Melanie has also just said, I just wanted to say everything I learned from Louisa in my crime and thriller course was amazing and she inspired me so much. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you. Oh, Melanie, that's lovely. Thank you. So, you were are great. You, are you still doing these courses? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah in fact, I'm um, one in the next, I think, few weeks or so. Yeah, with the Australian so Centre. How do people find out about them from you, Louisa? Oh, well, there, um, uh, I belong to, I work for the Australian Writer Centre and they um, promote all the different forms of creative writing courses as well as um, non-fiction uh, courses and journalism courses that they run. So um, I'm very privileged actually to be part of their lovely family of teachers. Um, yeah, and they're, and, they're, and they're great, yeah. Fantastic. So um, if anybody's interested in doing one of Louise's courses, you can go and check those out there. Um, so yeah, you and, and time, sorry, yeah. No, go on. I was just going to say, timing can work even overseas. Um, so, you know, some of the classes say, like now, uh, would be now um, in Australia. But, um, you know, if you're able to, um, you know, you could still do the course in England if you were able to, you know, uh, not be at work or, or whatever. Uh, in the morning, um, also in America as well. I think America's, uh, obviously there's different time zones, but um, people are waking up now, um, yeah. Cool, and Mordreth also says, I'm happily seconding Whitney's and Melanie's comments, super inspirational classes. Oh, okay, this is great. I hope, uh, Kim, is this being recorded? <laughs> it is, don't worry. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm gonna be going, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mildred. I really appreciate your lovely comment. So do you get much time to read yourself, Louisa? And if you do, what do you like to read? Well, um, I do read every night. Um, I love reading, but timing, as I'm sure you know, Kim, is it's, you know, um, it gets difficult and you're trying to write a book as well. Um, Yes, I, as I said, I read every night, you know, my husband might be asleep, but I'm still reading um, until my eyelids kind of, you know, you do that nodding thing that you do <laughs> and you can't read anymore. Um, uh, so I, I'm actually reading, um, a, I tend to have a number of books on the go at the same time. I don't know. Do you do that, Kim? Or do you do one at a time? I struggle with my concentration levels to do more than one thing at a time these days. Oh, uh, no. Well, I don't know. I suppose. Well, so I, I'm 
so I've got Left You Dead by Peter James because I'm a big fan of the wonderful, wonderful Peter James. Um, I've got, I'm reading two, I'm trying to remember now, two Bookature authors. Uh, one is Greg Olson, The Sound of Rain. Haven't started that yet. Um, Silent Voices by Patricia Gibney. I'm halfway through. Marvellous. Love it. Um, and I'm reading Sandy Wallace. Uh, she's a Aust fantastic Australian author and her book is Black Cloud. So I've got, and, and, yeah, so I've got, I'm, I'm one of these people that has a couple on the go at the same time. Depending on the mood, um, I sort of swap. Okay, excellent. What, um, because you're a creative writing teacher, what is the best bit of creative writing advice you could give to an author? Right, I think, let me think. Um, well, the first one would be um, keep writing. So I think the first one is, the problem is that um, people set off, they have a great idea, um, but they lose enthusiasm as it maybe gets more difficult or the structure isn't right. Um, cause writing book actually is really hard work. And, um, particularly if you've got a job at the same time, which was how I started and how most people start, you have a job at the same time. How do you find, you know, the time to slot it in? So the number one thing is you've got to keep writing. You've got to complete that first manuscript. And that manuscript is all about you getting your ideas down. Don't be too critical of yourself. That little voice, that little devil, we all have that little devil on our shoulders going, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. No one's going to want to read it. That's rubbish. And you have to try and ignore them <laughs> or that, that voice. Um, so that would be my first one. Um, the other would be um, whatever genre you're writing, understand what the expectation is of that genre from readers and publishers, I guess, as well. Um, once you understand that, then what you choose to do, you, you do from a position of, I know what's expected and this is what I'm going to do. Um, but I do think understanding that is really, really important. So you don't spend ages working on a book and realise that you've kind of not done the number one thing that, you know, say a crime fiction lover really looks for. Um, and then I guess the other one is create, re create characters that readers will care about. Like the central character, you don't have to love them. In fact, you might find there are things about them that you find a bit mm, in the beginning, but you've got to find them fascinating enough, interesting enough, sympathetic enough to engage with them, to keep going with them throughout their adventure, throughout their journey that they're going to go through. So I think in, an engaging central character um, is really important, even in crime fiction, which is a very plot-based genre um and, and like everyone who's listening to who's done my class will you know classes will go yeah, yeah yeah louisa you've said that so many times but character is everything like when we think about crime fiction even when it's on te television we don't start going oh did you see that one where that happened and that happened and he did this and then that happened that well you might do but what you're actually saying is you know oh you know i love this particular i love harry bosch i love jack reacher i love you know whatever it is it's the characters that you remember and they and they stay with you afterwards anyway that's that's how i feel about it i fall in love with the characters and i want to find out what's going to happen to them oh that's fantastic advice thank you for sharing that um another compliment for your writing classes here we have joe gavno says louisa is a fantastic teacher <laughs> At the end of her course, I've learned a huge amount of things, but most of all, her enthusiasm for the writing of her students left me feeling that I could write. Oh, Joe, that's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, this is oh. turned to being a really, you know, this is great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you making all those lovely comments. And I'm oh. glad it worked for you, Joe. That's good. Um now, you did say that, I hope that's still okay, that you might do a little reading for us in a little while. Oh, still... okay, yes. Um, Before we do that, I have one more question for you. Um, yeah, Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your process of, oh. of writing a book? So, you know, do you plot things? Do you wing it? You know, 
what are you, a, a plotter or a pantser? Oh, right. Well, um, when I started off, my very first book, I was a pantser. It was um, this idea, this this book I had to write. Um, I knew a bit about structure of a novel and that helped, but I certainly wasted time going off into dead ends where I shouldn't have gone and had to rewrite the book and so on. Um, I'm, I've now shifted very much over time um, into a plotter, Kim. Um, I find, so I'm a plotter and I do go into it now into, so for instance, with Widow's Island, it was, um, and Eagle Falls, a very detailed plan um, of what happens. But, and I think the big but of that is that the characters take off and start having a life of their own and they'll go and do things and say things. And I'm sure, Kim, you find this, where you almost like your character's doing something, you think, hold on, I haven't planned that, that, that. Yeah. And you think, actually, that's really good. That's much better than what I would have thought of. And you go, yeah, I'm going to go with it. But you so you, you have to be prepared to replot, as in adapt your plot, because actually what's coming out of this imagination of yours is much better than what you had originally uh, prepared to do so I think I'm definitely a plotter but with a degree of flexibility and I'd say by the final draft it's certainly changed and molded itself um yeah yeah what about you Kim mm, I, like to, I think I just wing it to be fair oh do you um, yeah. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, I, I do do a brief plan. Um, okay. I do like a nice little chart that's in lots of different colours because I think it actually stops me from writing. So I'm a big procrastinator. Oh, right. yeah. I like to do a pretty chart with my characters on and I know where their journeys are going and things like that. Okay. And then I start, I just put my fingers on the keyboard and the words just go. go. Yeah. Everybody's different though, aren't they? I mean, like you know, to any author anywhere in the world, and some will say, oh, I, you know, I never plot. But what I think they really mean is I've plotted to a certain extent, but it's all in here. I yeah. can't do that. I, I no way I can do that. I need to write things down. Um, and anyone who's done my classes will know that I've got this. Do you remember, Kim, the um, in the libraries before computers, well, really took over libraries, um, used to have these index cards where you would you yes. would able to flick through these little wooden drawers and you could flick through and you could go by author or title. Well, those little cards is what I use and I write each chapter on those cards and I lay them out on the dining table and I include, you know, the, the, the key action of that, um, you know, chapter, blah, blah, blah. Um, who the point of view is, what the key point of view is of that chapter. Um, and then I can actually see it laid out on the dining table and I shift them around. It helps me to sort of, but I think everybody's mind is different and that's how my, I like a big visual reminder. Yeah. Um, and that I was. Do, uh, yeah, I do use index cards actually. I was just looking around to see if I could see any. Um, and if I want to do a particular scene, I do kind of scribble it down thinking I need to remember that I want to put that scene in somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I am, Jell has just said there is a word called a plantser, which is a person who does a bit of plotting and a bit of pantsing. So I think oh. that's a good one. So I'm going to okay. be a plantser. A plantser. Oh, well, I'm yeah. a plantser. Yeah. <laughs> that's I think Jell, thanks. I've never heard of that before. I like that. So from now on, I'm going to tell everybody I'm a plantser. plantser. Yes, <laughs> I like that. Thanks, and Jell. Just before you do a reading, another comment, a um, couple of comments. Melanie says, I second that, Joe. Louisa gave such encouragement. And Mordra says, the exercises that you set us in the recent classes have resulted in my having developed several of my characters much more fully. And the scenes I have written with them in were so much more enjoyable to oh, write. Oh, brilliant. That's Which is really, it's really... It's really gratifying to, to know that I'm helping. That's lovely. Thank you for telling me. Absolutely. Right. Are you going to do a little reading for yes. me? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Sorry, when I say for me, I mean for all of us, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's all right, Kim. I'll just do it for you. That's okay. Um, all right. Can you, you can hear me okay? You can. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to read from the prologue. Um, uh, this is happening when they're leaving Whisper Island on the ferry um, in Washington. Um, and this is the prologue, and it's the voice of a killer. Emma asks me how I'm doing. I shrug, gaze into the distance with weary eyes, give her the lie that slips off my tongue like ice cream on a hot day. Good, I've got a new job, big money. Congratulations. Emma blinks, one, two, three, more like a flutter, her freckled face creased, squinting into the sunshine. She's waited until this moment to ask, three weeks after her wedding, as we stand on the ferry's upper deck, watching Seattle lurch closer. The wind slaps her wavy hair across one eye and she claws at the billowing strands, then tugs them behind a perfect ear. I hang my head, feel my shirt collar vibrate against my cheek, mouth droops, my hurt look, one from my repertoire of imitations. You should have waited. Beneath our viewing platform, parked vehicles squat, penned in like cattle, corralled for slaughter. Beyond the bottle green bow, white water churns, angry and loud, like the voice in my head. I'm not getting what I want. Both Emma's hands grip the railing. They don't grip me. Why do you do this? a note of sharpness in her voice. There never was anyone but Dustin. She squeezes her lips together, stopping anything else she might have said. We're still friends. Just because I'm married doesn't mean, it doesn't matter, I don't care anymore. Emma turns, so her back rests against the rail. Hair crowds her face, all I see is the tip of her nose. Don't spoil a great morning, she says. You haven't seen our new condo. Come take a look. We'll drink coffee and talk. It'll be like old times. It's as if her voice comes from the bottom of the sea. I don't see her. I don't see anything. Blindly, I raise a bald fist and slam it down. It hits the rail. She flinches. No, it won't, I yell. It will never be the same. Until then, I'd been in control. Heads turn, people stare. What are you looking at? I sneer at a middle-aged woman in Jesus sandals, a metal water bottle dangling from her day pack. She looks away, then heads inside, creating what she must view as a safe distance between us. There is no safe distance. Emma's lips are parted, her pale brows raised. She takes a subtle step away from me. Gone is the camaraderie. Instead, there's fear in the black holes of her eyes. Oh, Em, I'm sorry. It sounds like a great idea. But she's raised a wall between us. Oh, no, you don't. I create puppy dog eyes, please. Emma relents, she always relents, except over Dustin. I need the bathroom, I say, won't be long. I duck inside so she can't see my unguarded euphoria, like I've smoked strong weed and my cheek muscles ache to laugh. Past the cafeteria and down internal stairs to the near deserted car deck, where I won't be seen. Behind an empty bus, I stop, lean my elbows on the ferry's rail, allow the sea spray to cool my skin. Only now do I acknowledge the pain in my hand. For a while, we were, when we were teenagers, Emma was the closest I had to a friend. Then, one day, she stepped out of our relationship. As if fleeing my leaky inflatable boat, and jumping onto a sleek yacht 
and she set sail for calmer waters. That sleek yacht is Dustin. He isn't a freak. He remembers to gel his hair and brush his teeth and to ask her how she feels. From my pocket, I pull out my scuffed leather wallet with an unsightly bulge like a giant wart. I check that nobody can see, then slide my finger inside, remove the bulge. In the palm of my hand is a yellowed tooth, a premolar to be exact, root and all. Straggly threads of dried gum like prosciutto that's way past its expiry date. It had been an afterthought, a memento. I'm glad I kept it. I run the tip of my tongue over its ridges and dents, then trace the V-shaped root, licking the taste of her. She's mine now, and so will Emma be. Mm. Shivers. I think I'll stop there. Have I scared you? <laughs> you said the living day. I know that okay. I've already read it. <laughs> I think I'll stop there. I, think I, oh, I, yeah. I absolutely, one of my favourite things in life is to listen to an author read their own book because you get to hear it exactly how it's been written. Um, and that was absolutely incredible and proper. Even though I've already read it myself, proper gave me shivers up my spine. Oh, good. Well, that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and you know, um, thank you to Helen because Helen was very keen for the book to start. Um, you know, with something like this, and I wrote it, and, and I was thinking, oh, you know, this is a bit creepy to start the book, but um, you know, I think it sets the tone of what this poor woman, Stephanie, is going to have to battle. Absolutely. Um, and to all our um, listeners that are here today, Widow's Island is available to buy now on ebook or paperback. Um, and audio as well. Yeah. And audio, sorry, yes, and audio. Um, and if you have already read it, we would absolutely love, if you've loved the book, we would love to see your reviews on Amazon. Um, oh, please, always really yes always really really helpful for us as a publisher and for the authors to get as many reviews up as we can um, and it lets us do lots of different things from a publishing side of things as well um, so if you um, if you have read it and loved it please please do leave your reviews on Amazon um, and I'm going to leave you with one final question um, um, what do you love the most about being an author Louisa oh um I love the most just the writing. It's um, I I really am happiest. I know it's a, it's a lonely life in many ways, and I'm lucky, you know, um, you know that I I can do things like you know now we're allowed to go to the gym, for instance, which is really nice, and I can see friends, which is really nice. But what I love is that I'm actually doing something I love, and I'm doing it as a job, and I can't think of being more lucky really and working with wonderful people um I, I can honestly say everyone at Bookature has been amazing including you Kim I love you to pieces um but but yeah but it, it but honestly I I am very happy with my own little routine having my own little office at home and and just going to the world of my imagination and writing stories so I'm I'm very I'm very lucky Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. Honestly, Louisa, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, oh, it's been I'm great. And thank you for some brilliant questions. And thank you, everybody, for your brilliant questions and for joining me. I've just seen Robin's come in. Oh, Robin says I scared. <laughs> Sorry, Robin. <laughs> you scared me. Why I make you? laugh, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's right in the living daylights out of me as well, Robin. So don't worry. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. We are going to be doing some more Facebook Lives over the next um, few weeks as well. So um, do look out for our Facebook Lives if you enjoy listening to them. Um, Louisa, if I can get you to just stay where you are for the time being, and I'm going to disconnect this and just say thank you so much to everybody for joining us today, and we hope to see you all very soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Love you all for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.